I'm in the All show. All right. Jeff, don't don't screw up my intro, Jeff. This is John Reed, Tichinomica, and I've got Josh Greenbaum and Jeff Scott loosely corralled, and the emphasis is on loosely. These guys are coming apart at the seams. I think I might make for a good recording. We're about to find out. We're, we're going to be civilized, right, Jeff? Mm, no. Okay. No, oh, you're... Right. No. No, we're not going to okay. be civilized today. All right. But it's not, nothing to do with technology. It's about everything else. That's so we, we started this we started this podcast series to try to make sense of what the heck's going on with SAP and its customers and we just couldn't finish the conversation and that seems to be a perpetual problem so we keep doing podcasts and uh in, we're in entertaining to each other not, not to your audience John but with each other we find ourselves highly amusing and entertaining yeah well I'm gonna try to accomplish a bit of both uh so so uh we're we're about two months removed well a month and a half maybe from the ASUG Sapphire, ASUG Annual Conference Sapphire Experience. And there were a lot of threads that came out of that that, and it's been a busy summer for SAP as well. But one of the really big topics that we haven't had a chance to focus on, last time we looked at the role of partners and the innovation strategy, but we really haven't dug into the clean core concepts and issues enough. So we thought we'd make that our focal point because that is a very potent topic. I think there's a lot of interest from customers, but there's also, you know, some questions around, is this just a sales tactic? What does this really mean for me? So, uh, but we definitely saw that. I mean, at Tech Connect in the fall, the Clean Core sessions were jam-packed. So we're going to get into that. But before we do that, I kind of want to do a little bit of a roundup on sort of the questions that were raised at the conferences in in June, the co-location shows in Orlando, like, and where we go from here. Like, because I, I don't know about you guys, but I picked up on a few themes that I've been continuing to pursue since then. So I'd kind of like to do a little bit of a round robin and just share a few th- things that we're working on and thinking about and talking with customers about since that show. Uh, Jeff, I kind of know what you want to talk about. So I want to start with you because I think you got a good one. I I think what I appreciated was that we talked about AI and we got a little bit closer to the realities of AI while still having this very broad kind of conversation about what its future might look like. And how connected is that future to reality? But I appreciated a lot more on that versus another conversation connected to S4 adoption or rise or grow. And that was certainly in there as well. But I felt we we talked a little more. What I really loved, John, was a feeling that we got back to the pre-pandemic Sapphire and ASUG annual conference experience. There was an energy that returned to the environment. There was this sense of of engagement. And I, don't, I just don't think it was the concert at uh, Hollywood Studios on the last evening, but I think it was just that everyone just seemed to be really excited to be around each other. And I, and I love that about this particular event is that it's, it's for customers and they liked being around each other and thumbs up on that. Yeah. And just real quick, Jeff, just following up on that, I know you had some follow-up conversations around AI topics with customers since then. What are you, what are you hearing? What what are SAP customers thinking right now? I think they're processing right now, right? And I think not only is SAP coming to the table with a lot of thoughts and, and opportunities around AI, but so is every other software partner of a, of an enterprise. And so part of this is trying to discern and dissect what everyone's coming to the table with, and what does my strategy as a as a technology leader need to look like? How do I if I'm going to use you know I'm, I I might have and you know, I think one of the challenges is that almost every single part of your technology portfolio, someone is saying, I've got the AI tool for you. There is no one single tool. So how do you exactly bring these together? And I think we're still at the very early stages of that. I think there is acknowledgement that all of this can have tremendous value, maybe not a complete understanding of how to unlock that. But there's a, a, a belief that, that somehow, some way, this has to come at an equal value. So I think that's the good news, right? So I think everyone is assessing, listening. I, I was on the phone. Guys on the phone, it sounds so 70s or 80s. Uh, I was on a Teams call uh, with uh, one of uh, the ASUG board members earlier this week. And you know, we were talking about all the different things that they're seeing around AI. And, and you know, where do they jump? Where do they sit here and kind of watch and, and, and assemble? And I think One of the challenges that all of the collective technology companies have is to the extent they all keep injecting all of this in, it may actually create more of a compelling reason for customers to sit on the sidelines and watch this play out than actually jump in and do something because there is no one thing. 
Well, you know, the and, and not just customers. I mean, the investors suddenly are sitting on the sidelines. I don't know if you've seen yeah. the stock market today, but um, you know, led by well, led by led by the AI companies and SAP's now caught up in this as well. There's there's a little bite back around AI happening because the overhyping, I think, is you know boosted things a little too further than they a little further than they needed to go. It, it's it, actually the stock market is probably a whole nother set of podcasts, Josh. I mean, I just yeah, no, I, really. I, I watch this with just I, I called a buddy of mine up the other day who you know is you know in the stock market and I you know oh, we're all in the stock market. Sorry, he, he you know he's an experienced financial investor and i said can you can you tell me what's going on here because this does not make any sense to me that the market has gone off like gangbusters now the last couple of days it's pulled back a little bit but if you go back to earlier this week it was like this, this thing keeps growing and what's driving this and we couldn't and i had a meeting with a bunch of ceos yesterday that only exacerbated my confusion about the disconnect between the reality of of what's going on in you know corporate Amer corporate global corporations versus how the stock market's reacting, but that's probably a whole different topic. Yeah. And, um, and there's, I think there's some, what I would argue, slightly unfounded optimism coming into the market uh, with the prospect of less AI regulation after the supposed election. Um, but that's, that's a whole different can of worms. Agreed. <laughs> For those of you who really want to have an AI oriented podcast discussion, this is not going to be this the is podcast not for you. Sorry. Yes. Uh, mm. we, but we do have other SAP AI podcasts with the three of us where we got into that and and I have more stuff coming out into Genomica on AI projects. But I did want to mention just briefly on the AI topic and then I, Josh, I want to turn to you on the conferences. But just briefly on the AI topic, I did write about, uh, I think, a fairly landmark um, Goldman Sachs uh, report, AI is overhyped, wildly expensive and unreliable, uh, which I thought just kind of raised just a different level of consciousness, not that AI is necessarily all of those things, but that it provokes a lot of discussion. And I wanted to mention recently, I, I judged a bunch of enterprise projects for a competition and they were all data oriented. And the generative AI ones were really the weakest in terms of the value that the customer was achieving. Whereas some of the data analytics and even classic AI product products around like predictive maintenance and stuff were actually quite compelling. And so I think one of the big things, if you don't want to lose track of the AI thread in this conversation, I would suggest is that there's a lot of getting your house in order in order to sort of take advantage of what's yeah. next. And I, and I think that's going to be a big focus today. Um, so with that in mind, Josh, what, what kind of struck you from the shows? What I know you've been working on a lot of SAP projects since the show. So what kind of stood out to you? Well, you know, I, I think the real highlight for me uh, it, it was the shift towards a greater emphasis for s public cloud. And in particular, and I think this is core to the, a sub membership, um, the, the idea that public cloud can actually replace what there is perhaps a knee jerk reaction towards in terms of moving everything from ECC to private cloud. Uh, Muhammad Alam really, you know, carried that carried that topic around in several conversations. Um, I talked to some customers. We had conversations we can relate later, you know, within the ASA executive exchange about this. But I thought that was a huge a huge watermark uh, or landmark moment because there's such a, such a back backup of, of customers, not, you know, not implementing in the cloud. There's so much around why the cloud is good. We're going to talk about clean core. Um, and I think this was, this was a, this was suddenly a sort of a, a stake in the ground saying, well, actually there's a, there's another way forward towards moving to the cloud. Uh, it's this thing we've had called public cloud. Maybe we should be looking at it a little more carefully. So that, that really stuck out. Uh, for me, I think you know, um, I I agree with everything everyone said about AI, so I won't repeat that. I think the other thing is, you know, we did see some some aspects of Rise making more sense, and I, you know, this is sort of the story of Rise is that it continues to make more sense. It came from a position of not making a lot of sense to a certain extent uh, in the beginning. I still feel like every time I look at this sort of the the shopping list. Rise and the different editions, I feel like I'm buying a new iPhone and just lining up the different versions and trying to what are the features I get from this one and how what's how what's the battery life and those aren't really how we buy enterprise software. Um, but could it be? Well, sometimes yes, Mr. Scott. And that's Thank you me. know I, I'm I'm interested in the public 
cloud conversation precisely because there is a little bit more of that um, involved, but, but there is really, you know, back in the day when Amazon was, you know, getting, getting, <laughs> growing to dominance, every, 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 you know, line of business person wanted one click something. I wanted it to be one click. And, you know, we all, we in the trenches said, well, you know, if you have a simple enough process, of course it can be one click, but not a lot of enterprise processes are one clickable and not a lot of enterprise buying is going to be iPhone, you know, compare and contrastable either. So it's going to be a little bit, it's, it's going to have to be a, a mix of the two. So um, just to put a wrap on sort of the takeaways, uh, thanks for that. I, and I, I, I would agree that I think it was a successful show for SAP and the energy level of the show was high. Um, I was really glad to have been a part of the ASUG annual conference, pre-conference day though, because someone later after the show said, it was a whole lot about AI and stuff. And I said, well, you should have been at the pre-conference day because we really got real with uh, in our customer discussions that day around things like S4 migrations and cloud migrations and some of the issues. And the things that really jumped out to me were the, and I wrote about this, but some of the passion I saw for the public cloud from customers, the public cloud edition of S4 really struck me. And I hadn't heard that kind of passion and enthusiasm from customers around SAP products in a long time. So that I, I made a big note of that. And, and Josh, as you said, like, I think SAP also changed the messaging because they weren't so much, they used to really put the public cloud edition in the corner and say, well, this is nice for a few things, but it's not for other stuff. They wanted this really clear distinction between, you know, this is what the private cloud edition is for. It's for mostly most of our customers. And then there's this other thing for net new and some other stuff. There's more blurring of the lines now. And I think while that can be difficult at time for customers to sort, it's also better because they really should be looking at both. And I heard this customer on the public cloud challenging other ASIC members. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you looking at it? Why aren't you really plunging in here? Because here's the benefits and here's why it's so great. And then on the flip side on Rise, I think while Rise is improving as an offering, what I was surprised by was some of the depths of customer frustration around Rise, the perception that Rise is mandatory towards innovation, which we've discussed in the past. And then a lot of confusion, like if I quizzed you guys right now and, and said, please tell me the difference between the premium and the premium plus edition of Rise and what you get in each and how the commit to consume model works. I don't think any of you could, could totally answer that question. Sorry, maybe you can. Um, I think it would be tough. I'm not, to, sure a lot of pe- I'm not sure a lot of people at SAP could answer that question. So I think uh, that, I think, is a little bit of an interesting issue. Um, so I think SAP is left with this opportunity to make Rise better. But I think there's a lot of really good dialogue that could, SAP could have around that after the show that didn't really get addressed on the show floor. And even in the podcast I did, we didn't really get into all the confusion around the different Rise offerings and stuff like that. So there's a lot of work there. Um, but anyhow, I think some of that is going to end up coming back around when we get into the clean core discussion. So shall we move into that now? I would yeah. like to, I would like to, you know, acknowledge that I didn't say the word public cloud and both of you did. And, you know, from an ASUG perspective, um, I'm going to applaud both of you and bemoan that I didn't bring it up. About 9% of our, in our data and our research and our, and our, and our, continuing, you know, looking at what the ASUG community is doing. About 9% are reporting being public cloud customers, which, uh, but we are also tracking a much greater interest in public cloud. And I think back to your point, John, that that leads into the next conversation we're going to have. So that tells me a couple things. One is I think it's not, it, it may not always just be one or the other, there are a lot of use cases where I may use public cloud if I'm a global company. I may use it in regions and geos where I'm running smaller businesses or I don't think that the full power of a, of a private cloud ERP is, is, um, is what I need. And I, there's even an ASUG uh, board member who has a very concerted public cloud strategy in a lot of places in the world coupled with a private cloud kind of hub uh, and the spokes being all public cloud private cloud right. hubs spokes being public cloud sometimes the public and private cloud you know words i sometimes reverse and i don't mean to but they're so close so right. i think there's a lot of real good yeah. opportunity oh i apologize for that sentence there's a lot of really good ways in which customers can leverage the public cloud you know offering and if we really as a customer community want to leverage innovation as fast as we possibly can public cloud might be a really good way to do it. 
Yes, for a lot right. of very key key applications. Not for yeah. everything. Not for everything. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And we and we should probably do a dedicated podcast on that where we get into more of the adoption questions and the questions customers have around that. But more I'm sure podcast. I'm sure it'll kick in a little bit today, a little bit. But we should probably do a dedicated thing on that at some point. Like Sorry, what? Jeff, you were going to say. No, I just said more podcasts with the three. Yeah, ones. yeah, exactly. More. So, um, so, so I think this is interesting because you do have this juxtaposition where SAP has said, you know, from a cloud perspective, we really want you to be able to choose your pace of innovation. Now, granted, you know, especially the German user group might say, well, what about the on-prem choice? We're going to put that off the table. That's not. We're not talking about that today. Today, today is a clean core discussion. Um, and, and it's really, you know, I want to put it to you guys. I wanted to find clean core a little bit before, before we do that. I just want to throw out to you the, the jugular question, SAP clean core strategy, marketing and sales gimmick or important, valuable path for customers to, to strongly consider for their future SAP roadmap. What, what, which would you answer? (laughs) I'm not falling for that trap. Um, you can give nuances. You can you can you can share what you know somewhere in the middle. Um, where do you I, see it? I think this idea of clean core makes sense. I don't believe that we have done the necessary groundwork to fully define it in ways that the average customer can understand and grapple with and say, "I understand. I understand the idea. How do I actually exhibit this?" in practice in real life it's it's we uh, th- this is tangentially to how i react to this notion of technical debt because i think the antithesis of technical debt is apparently clean core but i don't believe that most customers most developers wake up on in uh, in the morning and say today's the day i am going to create a massive bucket load of technical debt i am going to sit here and code until my fingers are raw and create lines of code that no one will understand in the future. And I can go off and ride off into the sunset, laughing under my breath about all this amazing technical debt. I don't see it (coughs) as I cough. I think that technical debt happens because there's a deficiency or there's a defect or there's the the software doesn't do what you need to do. And you make decisions in the moment that necessitate that, that that, that's neither good or bad. And I think it's a to look backwards and say, well, today, I think you guys created technical debt 10 years ago or 15 years ago. isn't fair because these systems were not where they are 15 years ago. Well, and, and Jeff, just to add real quick, like acquiring technical debt can happen so fast too, right? Because when you want to acquire a company, for example, that fits in strategically with your business, you can't go tell the board, oh, you can't acquire this company because they're running an older version of J.D. Edwards. So, you know, if, the, if, if they think it's an asset, they're buying it. And then suddenly all your work on technical debt like is reset in a way. So I think we, we have to be careful about, about implying that as some kind of a, an evolution that you get to. And it's like, oh, today we're clean. We're good going forward. That's not how technical debt works. Right. And, and it's not how clean core works either. And I think that's really, I, I, yep. think, I think, you know, it, it's aspirational. Um, the good thing, I want, I want to give SAP a little bit of credit because since Sapphire, at least, you know, and in preparation for this podcast, I, you know, I was looking up clean core. On the web, I found some actually pretty decent assets that are starting to define it a little more carefully. Um, I think that it's you know that there's an understanding of it as a you know as a as a as an aspirational journey, not necessarily an absolute state of being. And and Jeff is gesticulating; he needs to say something. I, yeah. I hear you, Josh. I don't know that the customers understand that this is being. Oh portrayed that way you're I, I right think, that's what that's that why we're customers here Customers <laughs> are under the impression right that clean core is some absolute set of yeah. dimensions that you must adhere to or follow and that may or may not be accurate right so i, I think that's where you know I've, I've seen some stuff out of sap about clean core that you know makes my head spin a little bit because when i read it i'm like have you what are you trying to tell the customer base? If you're trying to say, here's an aspirational set of things that we would like you to think about, that that's a totally different communication strategy. And, and that's why I say, again, like, like everything in SAP, it evolves, the thinking evolves, the trick is to find the latest and greatest and discount the rest. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's, 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 been, it's been confusing. Um, 
I think right. that I think I think they're doing a better job. And and I and I I just want to say that of ultimately clean core really is something that cannot be an absolute anyway, because yeah, I, everyone, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So so you're gonna do as best you can to be right to be so, whatever it is. Yeah. Right. So so there's a number of different aspects to this. And, and I want to get into some definitions before too far so people can kind of get a sense of how SAP defines it and stuff like that. But um, one thing I will say is, like, uh, my attitude about this is influenced a lot by studying a lot of mod so-called modern ERP vendors that don't have uh, an install base like SAP does. And so what I have found that I like is the evolution of the SaaS market in SaaS ERP from what you might call more kind of vanilla configurations to stuff that's much more industry specific. And then the concept becomes that you have these extension platforms so that if you do need to do some things that are differentiating for your business, you're not stuck with just vanilla SaaS options. You can work with a partner, you can extend your software. And the idea behind it is that it's not going to break when you upgrade. So you can still absorb new features and new functionality from the vendor, but you can have this differentiating functionality that exists in the forms of extensions or even apps that you would acquire from a store or from partner development. And I think this is a better overall model for software. Now, I, it's not perfect and you can idealize it because there's still testing that needs to happen and all of that stuff. But I like that model much better and I've seen how companies get trapped when they do too much over customizations, especially on-prem, and the original developers are even gone. Uh, SAP has some shocking stats about the lack of usage of a lot of the customizations customers have built up over the years. They, we heard some of those at Sapphire. You know, there are things like upwards of 50% of what you've you, you know, customized. You don't even use those customizations anymore. So there's a reason for this. And I think the other thing from SAP's vantage point is while they want customers to say, oh, you can go to the private cloud and, and take it at your own pace. What they don't want is what they've run into a little bit with these S4 situations where you move to S4 once, but that's it. And then you don't ever move again. You don't ever upgrade again. And the upgrades are really difficult. And so the idea is that if your core is cleaner, you can upgrade better. And so I generally agree with the philosophy of clean core beyond an SAP environment. Like just in general, as a general concept in enterprise software, I agree, I agree. with it. But there's a lot of specifics around it, and you have to be really careful from an individual customer basis. And I would say that not all customers are created equal. Some are much more sophisticated in how they manage their data centers and their development teams than others. And so I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all, but I do give some credit to SAP in general for, one, pushing the conversation around this to get customers thinking, and two, as Josh says, more and more resources are being provided uh, when when we were prepping for this, Josh, we we found a bunch of stuff online. Like there's some pretty in depth stuff. There's certifications offered both for individuals and now there is a clean core certification for partners. Now some partners aren't happy with that certification. So <laughs> I, I need to point out that that some of that isn't like, oh my God, thank you for imposing the certification that we now have to use. So um but anyway, there's a lot of stuff out there. So that's kind of I think an interesting point to assess it. And that's why we're here today. I have yep. some statistics to share with both of you that oh, are great. off the press and your and this amazing riveted listener community that's listening to us today. Right, would you like to hear some statistics? Yeah, let's throw some stats. Straight from ASUG Research. Cool. We need a drum roll or some sort of, you know, sound effect. Uh, I might have something like that. Uh, I have uh, um you have a let's see, I have tambourine. um uh well, I have crickets. I have crickets <laughs> no, no and crickets. applause. Uh, no, uh, this probably does. Oh, there we go. There's crickets. <laughs> not, not I, I guess that's sounds, not as sounds like a that's not as good keynote. as like a drum roll. But yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Let's let's well, hear your research. While organizations realize that standardization is the goal, this is coming out of some stuff that we are we are releasing very even as we speak and just are just released just being released. 65% still need customizations moving forward with S4 HANA to meet business needs. And 42% say they have unique business needs that aren't supported by S4 HANA. I'm just giving you what the customer base is saying. Now, that may right. be accurate. That may be inaccurate, right? That's just how they're feeling. And why do organizations need custom code? 64% indicated 
that they need codes, they need the custom code because they have needs that are not covered by SAP standards. By the way, we did the survey last year. That's up eight points over last year. So it doesn't seem like that thing is going down. It's actually on the opposite way. It's going up. Uh, 53% say it's necessary to do integration and connect systems together, up nine points since 2023. 48% report it's necessary for analytics and reporting requirements for the business, up 8% over 2023. And 45% it's necessary due to regulatory requirements, up eight points over 2023. So I think interesting, very interesting data, maybe because a spotlight's being pushed on this. Because when we talk about clean core and, and the customer base tries to understand what this means for them, right? They're trying to figure out how do they do this, right? Um, to, to the good news, the great news, familiarity with clean core as a concept and options available to the extent of the core in the future, right? And how they think about this to extend the core in the future is up dramatically over 2023. 53% of those answering the survey were aware of the clean core concept, which I think is tremendous. Uh, that's up about uh, 20 points over 2023. So the concept, the idea of clean core is permeating the, the customer landscape, is being talked about amongst ASUG customers and is actually being listened to. Can I, can I throw some interpretation on that? Because it's fascinating because it really, I was going to, I had something prepared about. Never why. thought I was going to be the numbers guy in this in this. Trip, no, no, no. Brian, well, no, but it's, I, it's yeah, fascinating yeah. because because. Oh wait, me, uh, sorry, Josh. I got to interrupt for one sec. Oh, <laughs> oh that sounded like someone has well, asthma. And needs their inhaler. That, well, that's sorry. actually that's actually applause, Josh. Okay. Well, or me well, 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 well done. Uh, well done on the stats. Yeah, there. They're, they're not, they're, and All the numbers right, are. Myself today. Here, here's what's interesting to me is that. You know, one of my concerns about how Clean Core plays in the real world, as opposed to it's all wall to wall SAP world, is that it runs smack dab into the requirement for, for deeply heterogeneous environments that support really well connected end to end processes, which are two very, very important realities. We want more and more end to end process excellence. In fact, process excellence is part of Clean Core, but you're not going to get it out of the box, if you will, and you're not going to get just from SAP because most companies and certainly most of the ASAC members are going to have a heterogeneous environment. So when you look at this concept, I still need more customizations and I still am not going to get what I want from S4. The positive side of that is, I think, I'd love to ask the follow-up question is, how much is, is this thinking being um, being forced by your understanding that you need to have a more complex end-to-end -end process automation and integration function because you need to do better with what you've got. Because I think when you put yep. that together, we need more integration, we need more customization, we have unique business needs we're not getting, that's not a negative. These customers, I'm, I'm guessing, Jeff, your customers are also saying, hey, let's keep going. We're, you know, budgets are up and we're moving forward with this stuff. But it's going to be more complex. It's not going to be so. Basically, Jeff, Josh wants to redo your survey and ask some follow up questions of your audience. That that He's makes sense. He's welcome to. Um, <laughs> just 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 real quick, I wanted to make a really cr crucial point, and I don't want to get lost in this. But it, this came up a lot at ASUG Sapphire. SAP does make an important distinction between modification and customization, right. and they they talk mostly about no modifications, not no customizations. And and the difference being configuration, no, and configurations different. Okay, okay. so okay. so configuration is the ideal, right? Because configuration is is changing how your software is set up with a functional expert, changing things that don't have to do with any code at all, right? So essentially, that's no code, if you will. Um, customization is is customizing your own. Uh, code for various purposes, which is harder to do in the public cloud by a by a wide margin than it is in the private. Um, but modification has to do with you messing around with a code that SAP ships. That's the big no no. They don't. So so in other words, like customization, the way SAP is trying to define it is you're creating something new, kind of that you need. You're not messing with their code. So if you have questions about that, part of this lesson is. Get with SAP and figure out the difference and figure out if the stuff you're doing is going to really make your upgrades really tough or if it's a more manageable thing. So that's one thing. And the second thing that I care about is I don't care how much customers customize, to be honest with you. What I do care about 
is that they're working with someone they trust who knows this stuff inside and out. And it's a service partner that is not just taking on all their customization work, but is saying, here's what you should customize. Here's what you shouldn't. Here's what SAP is shipping in the next release that you don't need to do yet, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's more about having an informed conversation around this than saying no customizations. So that's my feeling. When I Back in my CIO days, um, when I had both configuration teams, and I'm going back a number of years, and you know, developers, ABOP developers in particular, there was always tension between those two groups, right? Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I saw is if you have ABOP developers on your team, they are going to develop ABOP code. That's what they do. It's neither good nor bad. That's just how it works, right? And, and ergo, that is now code that you as an organization have to take responsibility for maintaining. And the more of that you have, the more uplift you have to do and the more maintenance you have to do over time to make sure it's consistent with the system as it evolves. The configuration team sometimes say, I don't know how to configure this, give it to the ABOP team. The ABOP team will wonder why it's not being configured. So there's always this tension between those two teams. And I'm not sure we at that time as an organization always made the best decisions about which path we went down. I think sometimes it was left to preference, skill set of the individuals doing configuration or customization, right? So back to your point, John, I'm just double clicking on what you said. There's a lot going on behind the scenes of how these decisions get made. Yep. Right. <clears throat> Look, and, I think, and knowledge I think of what is out of the box, right? I mean, you know, I've, I've in my in my SAP experience, right, a lot of this frequently rides on the skill set of the consultant you're using. You know, sometimes you bring in highly skilled individuals who understand implicitly how a particular module works. Well, you have to give them a tremendous amount of trust that they know what they're doing and that they've stayed current with what the product is actually doing. Some are, some are not. The skill set, but also the business model. If your business model is centered around BTP and enhancing customers' products, that's different than the classic customization business model. Yeah. And so part of what a customer has to do is to identify firms that are forward thinking and how they approach this issue. Um, Josh, you were about to say something. Well, I, I just, you know, I want to I wanna focus on one of the main issues or one of the main reasons for Clean Core or one of the main definitional reasons for Clean Core is that you want to be up to date. And and I think, you know, you started, you know, this, we started talking in, in, on this topic about the, the fact that customers, a lot of customers implemented S4 once and never again. And, you know, I, I keep, I like to call them S3 customers because they're, they're sort of stuck there. That's a, that's a burden on everybody. Uh, it's a burden on SAP in particular, but also on those customers because they're they've they've really they've really walled themselves in. So I think I think just the concept of sort of bowing, if you will, <laughs> as a company, as a as a consumer, to be up to date is is already a a, a fundamental obligation uh, of uh, not just of you know to SAP. You don't you're not obliged to SAP. You're paying them money. It's to yourself as a customer to say, we, we, we need to be run, you know, you need to change the oil in your car every, you know, every X number of miles, whether you like it or not, because that's how the engine runs. Uh, if you don't, you burn out your engine. You don't want to burn out literally your, you know, your ERP core by running it on old, you know, an old tired software. I think, I think the other, the, the, um, the data quality and process design aspects of clean core are really important. Um, but these are these are going to be aspirational. We don't yeah. control data quality. We, you know, as you said earlier, John, you, you acquire a new, you know, a new customer. You may a new a new yep. company. You may acquire a company whose whose business model you are going to adopt and bring yep. on board inside. You're oh. not. They're not going to be a subsidiary. You are going to be their subsidiary in a certain business process right. or line of business. You, yep. You're going to have to try your best. To how many the, how many customers out there are running on global templates that were created years ago pre-merger acquisition that's been you know moved along in time I, I i've been in organizations where our template was from a parent company that sold us off a long time ago oh yeah and we still we're still modeling their general ledger because that's the way it was constructed so you look at what what is this general ledger format and you're like well that that was from such and such an organization you know, and you're like, well, we we divested, we were divested five, ten years ago. 
yeah, I mean, but the it's SAP historic, system, yeah, that, it's it's a, it, it's it's a reality for many SAP customers. Yeah, I think I think the other thing that I want to just add to the clean core discussion because in, in John, in Jeff, you know, this is one of my favorite sort of things to say is you know, there's the Thomas R Six organization and their focus on business transformation suite really plays a big role in this, and that, you know, and that yeah. that's one of the core mm-hmm. aspects of you know, of what is clean core is, is the operation sort of the operational excellence that you bring to managing this environment. And you, that operational excellence actually starts at implementation and moves forward and continues, you know, post go live in perpetuity. Uh, there's a tool set now that that's designed for that. It, it itself needs a little tweaking and a little integration to f- get really fully you know formed. But, but there, I have a lot of hope that, what SAP is doing at the technical level, again, in Thomas's organization in particular, when it's synced up with what, you know, engineering is doing for product development, the two together are going to make it a lot easier for customers to start with a clean core and maintain a clean core. And I think that, that's really... And that clean core important. is going to be essential, Josh and John, to driving, you know, a future where you have to innovate faster. And if you believe that part future? of what I... That was yesterday's future. Yeah. I know. If you feel a part of what te- IT's manda- mandate is to, is to make sure the business can innovate at faster and faster intervals, then that necessitates that you have to move this code back to the vendor who's providing it, right? It means you have to adopt clean core principles. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to innovate fast enough. Can, can and I and by the way, just localization at some point, but go ahead, John. Sorry, yeah. Go ahead. All right. We'll go back to localization. Um, but I want to get to SAP's definition bef- before we go any further. But I do want to say one thing, which is SAP's also been very clear, including my talks that I've written about with uh, AI chief Philip Herzig, that the more standard your data model is, the more eligible you are to absorb SAP's AI functionality when it does come. Faster, and the faster um, you can, right, John? Yep. The faster yep, you can get there. Yep, and and SAP has made no bones about that because when you look at where they deploy these models first, it's it's almost always within their cloud applications with structured data models like the public cloud and, and success factors are where a lot of these products debut. Um, and so I do think, while I don't agree with the, uh, you know, kind of, forcing a, a rise model to acquire innovation. I do agree with this concept that cleaner data models are inherently important for better AI. And so that is part of what's driving this clean core thing. Make no bones about it. But I want to read this to you. Josh, you found a blog post and I want to get both of your reactions. I'm going to just read you a few paragraphs because this, I think, is a good explanation of how SAP sees this. So this is uh, called How Clean Core Can Accelerate Your SAP Business Transformation. I'm not going to read the whole blog, of course. This is written by an A. Subert, S-E-U-B-E-R-T. So whoever you are out there, if I butchered your name, you did a great job on your blog. Um, the summary, the SAP Clean Core Strategy offers a straightforward way to simplify and improve the flexibility of managing SAP systems. It revolves around five key areas, extensibility, integrations, data, business processes, and operations. This approach lays out a clear plan for creating and keeping an IT environment that's quick to adapt and conducive to innovation. By adopting the clean core strategy rules and recommendations, companies can make the most of new technologies from SAP and its partners, helping them to thrive in the ever-changing business world. And then one more paragraph, because I think this is important. This is where it kind of gets real. In their book, Software Engineering at Google, authors Wright, Manshrek, and Winters share the idea that code should be regarded as a liability rather than an asset. They're getting at the fact that keeping code up and running isn't free. It requires constant care, maintenance, updates, and keeping it secure. As such, an abundance of complex code can significantly amplify operational costs due to the need for extensive maintenance. This aspect of treating code as a liability can also be applied to your SAP landscape. Reactions? Amen. I like it, but of course, yeah. (laughs) I, with with one, I, you I, found agree, the, I agree. You did find the blog post, so yeah, right. Um, I, I I sent it over, so yeah, yeah. I I might quibble with the word straightforward. If this was straightforward, we wouldn't be constructing a podcast about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think what Google says is accurate, right? And one of the things that I talked to a CEO about was every customization that we talked about. You know, moving to a moving to an environment where there's less customization in 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 their business. And I said, then when your operating folks come together and say, nope, we're not changing our business process 
our SCP implementation has to change. I said that change should be costed out, not just a one-time adjustment to code, but an annualized revisit of that. Just back to your point about, Josh, about a car, you take your car in and you get an oil change done every so often, same idea, that code is going to have an ongoing cost of maintenance, right? If I'm Google, I'm in the business of writing code all the time to drive my technologies as, as enterprise folks, yes, but not to the same degree. So maybe if we raise the price of what it takes to write that modification and maintain it, it might change the necessity and importance of making that. So if as a business need, I don't want to, you know, it's going to cost me a million dollars a year to make a software code change that if I made a business process change would cost me 100K, that's a very interesting conversation. Right. Josh, you want to talk about localization? I'd love to. Well, I, because right, it, here we this, go. Is a, this is a new interest of mine, not a new interest. It's always been an interest of mine. So it's very important. I, I think it's a very, very good way to understand the value of clean core and, and public cloud in particular, sort of combination together. And, you know, one of the things SAP does not get enough credit for is the incredible amount of work they do maintaining uh, hundreds of you know, permutations and combinations of, of different versions of their software specific to different local is local requirements, whether those are country, region, uh, um, state and local, whatever, uh, to, to an extraordinary degree. And one of the really brilliant things about having a clean core and a public core <laughs> in particular is that you, you really get localization as a service from SAP. That, that is, that isn't, you know, that isn't just uh, a good idea. That's, you know, that's keep your ass out of jail, keep your, Ass out of regulatory hell, uh, kind of stuff that that is that is invaluable and both you know to to sort of you know tout you know, SAP a little bit they do this better than most because they're just they can do more localizations than most but to really the the kind of work they do in these local uh, tax and, and regulatory regions to actually they literally are influencing or trying to influence how the regulations are written sometimes because because they know how how hard it is to implement this stuff. Um, and, and you know, you, if you don't have, I mean, you, if you don't have a clean core, if you don't have a public cloud, you have a modified mess in there, you're not going to get this this incredible value that, that you know, that is just, just comes with literally thrown a sweat. Um, and anyone who's been on the, on the wrong side of a regulatory problem or, or frankly is anticipating some of the new regulations we're going to see you know, in, you know, in, in climate, you know, related accounting, uh, this is, this is a big bonus and it, it's worth, worth thinking about as part of the, the value proposition for why you'd want to do this. Josh, I think what you talk about to me is a, is a metaphor for the conversation about why you would think about public cloud versus private cloud, why you would think about clean core versus non-clean core, this notion that I could maintain all the tax tables and tax rates for my SAP implementation internally. Right, but that takes a lot of people. The risk that it goes wrong goes up. If I can just buy a service that makes sure that that localization is correct in every single jurisdiction I do business, that is incredibly valuable, right? And that's to me, that's the same reason why you think about public cloud versus private cloud, because I'm going to move the responsibility for that to someone else who I'm going to hold accountable to do that. Yeah. So that's exactly the interesting thing to me about this conversation and why when you when you quoted those customization results i would want to hear more from those customers on what they feel they think they need to customize so for example with compliance stuff on the local level that i feel strongly that should either come from the vendor or from a partner and there's some partners that do some fantastic stuff i once wrote a few years ago on a partner that did a bunch of labor union related stuff and compliance related stuff for success factors, uh, for example. And, and so a, a, the vendor or the partner, in my view, should be dealing with the compliance stuff. And then you look at it and I want to know, are you really differentiating with these customizations or is it just something that you've done differently for a long time that maybe you could just change? Now, I know that your people aren't going to like those changes. And I think some of the customization comes down to a fear of inf you know invoking change amongst your employees. And I get that. Employees are resistant to changing how they do things. 
but I'm sorry, the way you handle dunning on invoices is not a competitive differentiator. And, and just because you've always done it that way and you've customized it that way, I think someone needs to push back and say, look, that's not where you should be putting your energy and time. Oh, our employees will push back. Well, you have to push back on them a little bit and say, we're trying to compete in the global economy here and keep everyone's jobs. And the way we do that is not by wasting time on custom stuff when there's a much better solution that will involve less clicks and less screen time and more automation if you will just adapt to it. And so I think these are the healthy conversations. And I don't think they should be coming just from SAP. Oh, this is a sales pitch from SAP. I think this is like everyone involved should be having these conversations and then customize your system once you've had those conversations. That's how I see it. But anyway. I, I, need to, I need to just add it from painful personal experience that often the, 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 the fear of removing customizations is grounded in a, in, a, in a company history of bad change management practices. And that companies need to, you know, need to understand that there are ways in which, you know, you said, you know, I, I don't like this. I mean, there is a sort of tough love sometimes you have to do. Like, we're just not, we're just going to standardize on a customer record, damn it all, because it's ridiculous to carry this thing over, as, you know, from four acquisitions ago. But, but there's also a way in which I think companies need to look at change as something that they do. It's more effective when it's done in a proper sort of change management environment where you sit down and really, you know, workshop that customization and, and, and don't just say yes or no. Don't just say, yeah, we're doing it because we've always done it this way. No, we're doing it this way because we insist, but, but try to try to get to the root cause of that. I think that a lot of times the, the lack of good change management practices leads to these kind of unnecessary confrontations uh, and, and really get in the way of, of the kind of things we're trying to talk about today such as clean core. Yeah. Change management is a significant issue and it gets more complicated, Josh, the bigger the organization, the larger the geographic dispersion of it. You know, if you've got a business process executing globally, being utilized by thousands of people, yep. changing that business process is much more challenging than if it's being used by 10 or 15 people, right? Right. Um, and I think a lot of or larger organizations when they run the math and the complexity of those types of broad global changes might in fact c conclude, and I'm not, I'm not making a value judgment here, that changing the software is less expensive than trying to change the people. Right. Um, well, I'm not we, saying it's we'll right, but be, right. yeah. Um, so you, you get sometimes I think change management gets into some of those complexities. Right? And look, I think that might be totally fair at times, right? Because I think there is a pace of change thing to consider yeah. with your people. And you, I could envision a manager saying, like, like you just gave an example. Like, we got 5,000 people that, that run it this way. They've been through a lot this year. We're trying to get them focused on other stuff. They're starting to use this new cloud-based software for procurement as well. So we're not going to change this right now. Fine. But at least you had the conversation. Whereas in another case, it's like, wait, these customizations were dependent on three developers, two of whom have retired, and yeah. one of whom is leaving in six months. Yep. You know, and so then you're like, oh, okay, like, like, so I think there's a prioritization exercise here. I don't think it's this magic thing. And I think in the past podcast, Jeff, you've made a really important point that this fantasy about removing technical debt and, you know, and it, I think it's like something that you kind of live with a little bit. It's not this thing of like, oh, we have none of this, you know, you're going to have some of it, but it's a question of exactly what type of debt and are you inventorying it on a regular basis. And and I do want to throw in the security aspect too, which is yep. that that some of these old system is like your security is only as strong as your weakest link. And getting exposed right now from a sort of hack standpoint and uh and a and a data standpoint is like, I mean, look at the press. I mean, every day if the story's not about AI, it's about a breach. Yep. And while the latest breaches have mostly been around bad cloud software management, in the past, there's been a lot of breaches that had to do with legacy software holes. And right. so the more you do this, the more you have a security conversation as well. Which comes back to a point I made a little while ago, John, that most organizations don't properly cost that customization over time. It's viewed as a one-time cost with zero maintenance to it, right? So it looks really, really cheap on paper, <laughs> right? Hey, if I can spend a thousand bucks and get this 
change done. I never have to touch it again. I should do it. But the problem is that's not that that is not an accurate costing model. Right. So uh, we need to head towards a wrap, but I want to ask yeah, one more key question before we get to our closing comments. Um, I want to ask you a loaded question. Do you think the partner community is ready to deliver on what's needed here for customers in the way that we describe, which is not just to sell clean core and I'm clean core certified and we're going to get you, but to have the kind of nuanced conversations we're having now. Because one thing I saw at ASUG Tech Connect that I really liked is that you had partners on the floor that I could have these conversations with. And that was really cool because that was the first show where I remembered really having that conversation with multiple partners around different things they were doing with BTP and stuff like that. And they really seem to understand the technology and how to use it. But what do you guys think? Are, are the partners like kind of ready for this now or do we still have work to do here? Yes and yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes yeah, and yes. Ready Excellent. And have work Perfect. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And yes, I would echo Josh's sentiment. I believe uh, I was more pessimistic about this earlier uh, this year and last year. I've, I've, I've watched some of the partners really impress me with their level of engagement around this recognizing that this is a better long-term operating model for them as well. So I think they are agreeing. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, particularly, you know, as both of you know, I work a lot in, with smaller partners, with more boutique partners, with the hungrier and, and you know, and, and feistier side of the business. And they, they get it because they see both their ability to differentiate uh, against the you know against the global SIs, but also they see a real skill set. Matt, this is what they actually a lot of these smaller companies right. think about anyway. Um, they're not in it for you know for billable hours and you know and endless you know endless um, you know reworking. So they want it. They want to get in there and get get the job done. So I, I'm pretty optimistic that there is a growing understanding within within a large part of the uh, the partner base. Um, they are, I'll flip, you know, we talked briefly, you mentioned briefly that, you know, the certification problem. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned on behalf of these smaller partners that, you know, certification is something that's much easier for a very large company to absorb from a cost standpoint. Uh, and often it's more necessary in the very large SIs where they've got, you know, they've got a lot of kids out of school kind of thing that sort of need to make sure that they've proven their, their, their metal and, and, and maybe haven't and certification is good for them. I think a lot of the, more experienced partners with more experience, you know, under their belt. This is a, they see this as a waste of time, and they they want to they want to get beyond that, you know, that union card kind of mentality and just get to work. So it it cuts both ways. It requires it requires if you think about you know a balancing act and a very precarious balance with a lot of weight sitting on top of three important pillars: SAP, the partner and the customer all have to be at the table willing to share that load. Otherwise, it's not going to work. The, the partners are willing to say, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to adopt these new principles, and I'm going to adjust. But yet the customer still is trying to grapple with a, a, a different mindset inside their organization. It's not going to work. Yep. And, it and three to screw it up. It, it is a very new discipline, and it is very easy to blink and say yes to something and pay the downstream cost. Because sometimes I'm not going to be around when that when that downstream bill comes due. Yeah. Right. And 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 I think SAP does have to be a little careful with some of this stuff to the points you all made because I did hear from one partner that was worried about like, you know, SAP saying, well, they're not clean core compliant because they did some customizations with a customer or a customer's not clean core compliant. So like I hope these certifications add value, but don't take away from, you know, the folks that really have experience and can have a more complex conversation about this and realize this is a journey, not some report card. Oh, you failed on Clean Core, so sorry, you cannot pass go. You cannot, you cannot collect your upgrade or whatever. So, all right. So, Jeff, final words, of, final words of advice from you based on this conversation for customers, but also ASUG members. Clean core is a journey, not a destination. It makes sense. And customers should be taking the notion that every single customization that they write has a long-term cost to it that will potentially slow down your ability to adopt future innovation. So do it 
going in with your eyes wide open that the business case for it over time is more is greater than the downstream risks of of you know not being able to move and the more you add the bigger that becomes yeah and i think i've said that in general i view that the differentiation is about app building not about code customization but that's a little bit of a generality like i said some customers are more sophisticated uh, I, I guess I just wanted to close my comments, and Josh, you're going to have the final word here, but my comments are basically, I really encourage customers to seek out their peer groups on this, as well as get the latest from SAP. That includes, obviously, ASUG and other user groups. I think those these peer-based conversations are invaluable on this topic. Um, reject any kind of, you know, kind of golden rule or status quo and find your own rhythm around this, but also I think this is not a marketing gimmick. I saw something on Reddit saying this is a scam. Um, but then the this that same comment on Reddit said they're just trying to get people to move to P BTP. And I'm like, well, yeah, this this is the point. Like BTP, that's not a scam. That's an extension platform. All cloud applications providers have them. Hello. Um, but it's kind of funny to see that on Reddit and know that that's like, you, you might say, oh, well, Reddit's garbage. Well, you're using um, OpenAI, aren't you? Well, OpenAI trained on Reddit, so is OpenAI garbage. Well, that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, <laughs> finally, I just want to say, cast a wide net with partners. I, I, I know I always say that, but there's some really interesting small partners that are really aggressive about a BTP focus. And I would just say, don't inherit your last partners. Challenge them to show that they're current and relevant on this stuff. And if they're not, talk to new ones. Josh. Okay. And take us I, home. I, take us home. I'm going to say that, you know, for the customers listening to this, um, I think at the end of the day, you really want to focus on end-to-end -end process excellence and the processes that drive the most value and differentiation and try your best to do that with clean core in mind. But clean core is not the, the goal. <laughs> process excellence in business is the goal. Clean core should be only one of the ways in which you achieve it, an important way. But get the processes right, too. 100%. All right. Well, we're not out of topics, but I think we are out of time. time. Thanks for our listeners to following us. Let us know what you want to hear from us next. I'm leaning towards a public cloud and industry cloud conversation, but we'll see based on your interests. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you.